Dan Rather at CBS News World Headquarters in New York with Ed Bradley and Anthony Mason here at the anchor desk with me now. It's 12.30 in the East, headlines of the hour on the attack on America, 41 known dead, thousands still missing. That includes 259 emergency service workers, mostly firemen, some policemen, in the ruins and rubble of the collapsed Twin Towers of New York's World Trade Center. There are 1,700 known injured. The search for survivors is underway uh, and will continue for a long while to come. Pause and note that you may be saying to yourself, well, those figures are pretty low. Indeed, they are. However, there's an immense job of getting through the rubble and debris uh, to find what are expected to be many, many more bodies. In Washington, Pentagon officials expect to find no more survivors of the attack there, though they now believe the number of dead will turn out to be well below 800. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld told uh, CBS's David Martin a short while ago that while he doesn't know what the final death toll will be at the Pentagon, Secretary Rumsfeld expects it to be, quote, well below the uh, estimated uh, by some 800. The FAA's unprecedented national ban on air traffic remains in place. This is a change from what was expected today. The air travel ban remains in place. Congress reconvened today amid tight security. President Bush has asked Congress to spend whatever it takes to recover from the terror attacks, which the president calls, and I quote him now, acts of war. Now, for the impact on American business, on the economy, on financial markets, CBS News correspondent Anthony Mason. Dan, the impact by every measure is huge. I mean, as you've been talking about, first and foremost, there's, there's a personal impact. I mean, many of these companies today are still in an all-out search to find all of their employees. Uh, it wasn't just the World Trade Center. That obviously was, was the hardest hit. But you're talking about, I mean, around across the street from the World Trade Center is the World Financial Center, which is the global headquarters of Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, American Express has offices in there. Those buildings, which are also huge, are, are, are inaccessible today. Many thousands of financial workers can't even get to work. Some are trying to work from their homes. Uh, in the meantime, I've talked to corporate executives who literally have lists of their employees. They're going down them one by one, trying to find where all these people are. I think we can conservatively say there are hundreds, if not thousands, of financial employees still missing at this hour. Well, Anthony, we haven't talked at all about the effect on um, businesses. Let's take one area of the economy, uh, the airlines. Now, just in, Midway Airlines has announced it's suspending all flight operations. Hearing the FAA say they will no fly again today, Midway Airlines suspends all flight operations, and 1,700 people employed by Midway Airlines lose their jobs immediately. It's this sort of ripple effect in the economy that everybody has to be concerned about. Uh, there's, there's that immediate effect you're talking about. And, and what economists have been saying for the last two days is they're very concerned about a psychological impact. I mean, we've been talking for months here about an economy that's kind of teetering on the brink. Mm -hmm. And many people have said to me for some time, all you need is one little shock and we may not be able to take it. So the question here is how much psychological damage does it do to people? Are we going to stop spending money because we just want to sort of huddle in and feel safe and secure? If that ha happens, the whole, whole economy, not just you know, Midway Airlines, will come screeching to a halt and we'll, we'll, we'll tip into recession. Ed? Well, this is a company, Midway Airlines, that was experiencing economic problems before this. So this is that kind of ripple effect. This is the shock that you talk about that pushes them over the edge where they're canceling everything. On the international front, uh, the NATO Council, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Council, may indeed invoke the Mutual Defense Clause in the wake of this attack on the U.S. Now, this is according to a high-ranking NATO official. This dovetails, Ed Bradley, with what you were talking about, or at least we mentioned at the very top of the hour, that what President Bush is attempting to do, and this was the pattern his father, uh, President Bush the Elder, used in putting together a coalition uh, uh, to conduct the Gulf War, what they're trying to do is invoke this mutual defense clause, have NATO do that, which gives uh, um, immediately some weight and uh, of, a, of alliance for President Bush in his efforts to, to find who did this uh, and to punish those who did it. 
uh, if this actually happens, it's a very important development. That's the point yeah, here. I, th I think it's, it's good politically for the president. It's cover that he needs politically to show that he has the support of European allies. But the, the, the first problem that, that he has, that this country has, is who is the target? Who do you go after? In the Persian Gulf War, you had Saddam Hussein sitting in Kuwait. And it took seven, eight, nine months to, to mount a coalition to, to go into to Kuwait to move him out. At this point, who is the target? Who are we going after, even with the support of our European allies? And that's the question that has to be answered next. Absolutely. And the only reason for dwelling on this for as long as we have is invoking the mutual defense clause of NATO is no small step. And to have a NATO official indicate mm -hmm. that they are indeed moving in that direction is significant. Let's go down to John Frankel, who's in the Wall Street area here in New York. John? Uh, Dan, we are now standing at North Moor and the West Side Highway. We're probably about five blocks north from where the World Trade Centers stood. You can just maybe make out the smoke there. There's a, there's a helicopter flying over the scene now. The smoke now seems to be moving towards the east. That's the direction in which the wind is blowing. We've had an opportunity through the course of the morning to talk to several people, most of them volunteer rescue workers who have been close towards the wreckage. We want to describe some of the wreckage to you at first. We were over by the Church and Reed intersection, and if you look down towards the area, you can see there is a sort of awkward looking sculpture that's what it appears to be and what it actually is is the steel beams that sat on top of the world trade centers and when the buildings collapsed they fell straight down and were impaled in the ground we're also told that the rubble in many places is waist high there is a coating of dust on almost everything that wasn't burnt and and just disappeared completely uh, the area is under tight control at this time. Uh, we've been moved to, to certain areas and cornered off. Those people in the media who have tried to make their way closer to the site of the bombing have actually been taken away, some in handcuffs and moved off. The, the police officers in this area and the National Guard are keeping a really tight control of the area. Now, as you know, there have been reports of some people who have been rescued out of the wreckage. We know of uh, five firefighters and apparently two Port Authority policemen that have been rescued. We had a, a chance to speak to a Nassau police officer, a Richard Doerr, who helped rescue one of those firefighters. The whole time down there, he was talking to us. Uh, his vitals were apparently in good shape. Uh, the New York City uh, medic and the doctor on the scene, uh, they kept him in good shape all through the night uh, with medication, uh, keeping his vitals up. Uh, they did a great job. We have also been told that while there is that handful of firefighters that have been rescued, the toll now around 220 firefighters, police officers, and other rescue personnel that have been confirmed dead. Last evening, some of those bodies were taken across the river and towards New Jersey. Now we're being told that a temporary morgue has been set up at the 91st Pier, which is uh, up by Chelsea Piers, about 23rd Street and the West Side Highway. Um, we also had an opportunity to talk to one of the other volunteers that came in from South Plainfield, New Jersey, a, an officer, Wayne Diana. And he was uh, situated in Middlesex County, New Jersey, and a whole bunch of volunteers were taken by bus to Staten Island last night and then ferried into Manhattan about midnight. And then they managed to make their way to Ground Zero uh, at the site of where the World Train Centers stood. He and some of his fellow officers were then positioned and asked to go through the rubble. He said that there wasn't any real orderly procedure to what was going on. There was really a lot of chaos. Uh, again, a lot of the debris, waist high, making their way through it. Some pieces extremely small, some pieces quite large that needed to be cut, steel beams that needed to be sliced by heavy machinery. I can tell you that along West Side, the West Side Highway here, uh, right now it seems to be that they've opened up the flow of traffic a little bit, but a lot of the vehicles, the major big construction rigs have been stacked up here. They're trying to get them down towards the scene as best they can. If I can offer one observation point for those who are New Yorkers and those who have visited New York, we have described the World Trade Center towers as landmarks, but they are also real guideposts for those people who come to New York. You look around, you don't know where you are, you see the trade centers, you know that that was south. That no longer exists. Dan? John Franklin, um, in the lower port of Manhattan, in our Washington Bureau is the, until recently, 
Secretary of Defense of the United States and former Senator, former Congressman Bill Cohen, who is now a CBS News consultant. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being with us this morning. First of all, describe for us the significance of NATO invoking the mutual defense portion of our agreement with NATO, keeping in mind that they have not yet done that, but the indications are strong that they're right on the brink of doing it. Well, if they were to do that, uh, Dan, it sends a very uh, strong signal that all of the NATO members are prepared to support the United States uh, in its actions to defend uh, our freedoms. Uh, that's important uh, because this is uh, a declaration that an attack upon America is an attack upon all the members of the NATO itself. And that means that uh, they will be in it with us uh, to, to the end uh, in fighting this war. So that's a very significant uh, act uh, should it be taken. Now, how hard is it to find this terrorist? Well and good, our NATO allies say, well, they'll help us. We'll see whether they make good on that talk. But how hard is it to find out and to pinpoint who did this? It's a school of thought that says, listen, you, you'll never really find out for sure. Well, first, we have to be uh, somewhat cautious on this. I recall yesterday, for example, I was uh, in the process of conducting uh, an interview, and uh, there were reports about an explosion in Kabul in uh, Afghanistan, and immediately uh, it was concluded or assumed that this was the United States responding uh, by attacking uh, Kabul itself. Uh, I had to at least urge caution that it was more likely uh, to be a, a part of a civil war that was ongoing, and it turned out to be the case. So we've got to at least have some measure of caution before we jump to a final conclusion. In this particular case, I think all of the footprints would seem to lead uh, to Osama bin Laden or his associates. In that case, uh, we know from past experience that he has, in fact, been harbored. Uh, in Afghanistan. And so it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where he or his group may be at any given time. Uh, it is not difficult uh, to at least conclude that he's still in the country and has the, uh, the uh, safe passage and also the support uh, of uh, the, uh, the Taliban. So we know generally where he is, not, not specifically, but then again, uh, concerted action could be taken. Uh, to put the uh, Taliban on notice uh, that they will be held accountable, as President Bush said. There will be no distinction made between those who harbor uh, the terrorists and, and uh, those who are committing the acts themselves. This can require a, a variety of different responses, diplomatic, uh, economic, uh, isolation, ostracism from the international community, shutting down the level of commerce that they can conduct uh, with members of the international community, and then, of course, military action. Uh, Secretary Cohen, Ed Bradley here. I, is right. it significant, uh, we're told that the, the NATO officials are saying that they, this would be political support, but they would not necessarily supply military units or any other kind of military support to the United States. How well, significant is that? Uh, it's important that uh, our NATO allies, uh, as we say, belly up to the bar on this one. Uh, this is an attack upon freedom, as President Bush and others have uh, indicated. This is an assault upon civilization. They are part of that. To the extent that they simply say, we're behind you a thousand percent, but you go carry out the war because uh, we're not uh, prepared to bear the burdens of what response might be taken against us, it tells you something about the solidity and indeed the viability of NATO itself. So I think this is uh, not simply words here, but some deeds. And they're going to have to uh, uh, come to the, uh, the aid of one of their key NATO members, much as the United States also came to the aid when they were in doubt as to what they might do in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, and any other uh, potential uh, operation we might have to conduct. This is a mutual treaty and a mutual defense treaty, and we have been attacked. And so they can give us uh, more than words and will be required to do so. Mr. Secretary, what kind of retaliation could President Bush uh, expect uh, to do effectively? Again, there's a school of thought that says, listen, even if you find out who did it, it turns out what are you going to do in Afghanistan? What are his options? Well, I, I wouldn't want to uh, discuss uh, openly at least the options that the president will consider. There have been a number of contingency plans developed uh, by the, uh, the Pentagon, the military, uh, over the years uh, for a variety of uh, types of operations. And the president uh, obviously will look uh, at uh, this uh, schedule of, or menu, I would say, of, uh, of options and then decide whether or not it's feasible and will have, uh, be effective. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, also uh, indicate here another measure of caution. Whatever response the president decides upon, and he will have to do so within a reasonably short period of time, and I, I heard before that commentary was that, well, patience uh, is now being exercised, and that's true, and it should be. Patience is a virtue, but it need not be eternal. There's going to be a time clock running here with the American people and what they expect 
the president to do. So on the one hand, he has to be patient to get all the facts. On the other hand, not too much time can uh, be allowed to uh, transpire before he is called upon to take some sort of action. Second point is that what we have to do is to make sure whatever action is taken, be it diplomatic, uh, economic, or in this case uh, military, or a combination of all three, that it be really well thought out and well executed. The last thing we want to do is have what happened yesterday, is have the scene switch to uh, a, a fuel dump uh, exploding over in Kabul with uh, the focus being on what was taking place there. We want to remind the world and the American people what has happened on our soil. Those two trade towers have now collapsed with the assault upon the Pentagon. This is the image you want to keep very much in the mind of our allies as well as our adversaries, because this is what's going to galvanize the American people to sustain a long-term commitment against this war against terrorism. Former Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen, thank we'll be talking to you as the day and evening goes along. Let's check in now with our chief Washington correspondent, Bob Schieffer. Bob? Uh, good afternoon, Dan. You know, I was struck listening to former Secretary Cohen just now when he said that it's time and we're going to have to ask our allies, our NATO allies, to belly up to the bar. What struck me about that is those almost the exact words that Senator Ted Kennedy, a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, said to me this morning uh, as I was coming into the Capitol. And I think that underscores the resolve that you're seeing at this Capitol. I'll tell you something, Dan. I don't know if it was Winston Church or whoever it was, it said that is nothing quite so exhilarating as being shot at and missed. The people at this Capitol think they were shot at uh, when they evacuated this Capitol yesterday and people were running out of this Capitol. It was because the police had told them there was an aircraft coming toward the Capitol. Now, whether that was or not, whether the plane that crashed in uh, Pennsylvania was indeed headed for the Capitol, perhaps we will never know. But people here thought that it was. They are taking this personally. Uh, I've never seen such unity. Trent Lott was on the floor of the Senate today saying we need to be on a war footing. When the president said this was an act of war, it was what Democrats and Republicans were waiting to see here. Uh, Tom Daschle, the leader of the Democrats, in another show of unity, uh, said, I am outraged as a senator at these acts. Now, uh, both houses are going to pass a joint resolution strongly supporting the president in tracking down and punishing uh, the people who did this. Then later tonight, there's going to be a prayer vigil here. But this, this was a shaken capital, Dan, and people here are not going to soon forget uh, the events of yesterday. Bob Schieffer, thanks. Bob, live from the capital of the United States in lower Manhattan where they search for bodies and for that matter they're still searching for people who may be alive in the rubble they found some uh, overnight uh, hopes run high that they can find some more but many people are down in lower Manhattan looking for information any information on missing relatives and one of those people searching 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 is Sean Manning whose wife worked on the 100th floor of the World Trade Center thank you for being with us Manning tell us what you're you doing? doing at the moment. Uh, right now, me and my brothers, um, they're on the west side, and my, me and my best friend are going toward, towards hospitals and shelters, just leaving flyers and checking the list to see if she's been found. When, when did you last hear from her? Uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. She hopped on the 735 train from Locust Manor in Queens on the Long Island Railroad, and a couple of her friends said she went inside the building when the first plane hit. I don't know if she went upstairs or if she was downstairs, but uh, that was the last I heard from her. And where have you been looking? How have you been looking? Um, we've been calling on phones. Um, today was the first day we, they allowed us to come into the city. Uh, we've been to, I went to Bellevue right across from me. I went to Beth Israel. We stand online at NYU. I got my brothers who's on the other side of town at St. Vincent and Lenox Hill. I got another brother who's in Jersey checking those hospitals out. I have another brother who works for the MTA that's checking out all those people that was in the subways. So my whole family and all my close friends are, we just, just putting the message out, just hoping that she's alive and tell her to call home. That's all, that's all we want. Sean Manning, good luck to you and thanks for talking to us. This Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you for giving me a time. Ed Bradley, here we, we have, you know, we, we talk about NATO invoking its mutual uh, defense pact. We talk about the impact on financial markets. Midway Airlines suspending operation, firing people. But here, 
in, in microcosm with this young man desperately searching for his wife. This is the cutting edge of this story right now, and it will remain that way for quite a while. And, and I think a lot of people remember the, the Murrah bombing in Oklahoma City, where you had rescue workers pulling people out, I think, for 15 days, 15 days after the explosion. They found someone alive and, pull, and pulled them out. And I think there is that kind of hope that, that people have. But the difference between the Murrah building in Oklahoma City and the World Trade Center, there you had eight, nine stories collapsing. Here, you had more than a hundred stories coming down on top of people there. And the, the reality is that yes, some people will survive, but it's much more difficult to survive that than to survive the Murrah building in, in Oklahoma City. Anthony Mason, you spoke earlier that yes, there's an effect on the economy, yes, there's an effect on the markets. The World Trade Center was right at, right at the heart uh, of, of Wall Street and trading. But so many of the people who worked uh, there are searching for their, searching for survivors first, searching for their own family members, and never mind the accounts, never mind what's happening to the economy, uh, the economy of the market. People come first, Dan. In in we've we've talked about this in many ways, but in in every town around New York City, in every suburb in New Jersey, in Westchester County, in Rockland County, somebody knows somebody who's got somebody who works down you know, at the World Trade Center or Wall Street. I mean, I know the wife of a minister last night in the town where I live spent her whole evening calling every member of the congregation to make sure everybody was home. And I know of somebody in that town who did not come home. And I think everybody in New York City has a connection like that right now. So everybody is feeling in this area, is feeling this, this very personally right now. And that is the heartbeat of this city at this moment. Let's go to Washington and Bob Orr for more information on what is and is not happening with America's airlines and our transportation system, Bob. Well, Dan, for the moment, all flights remain grounded. We're still in this unprecedented national ground stop. And frankly, the people inside the FAA are wrestling with what to do. Do they, do they take the risk of opening the system too soon, or do they go too slowly and send the message that the system has been badly damaged? While that's going on, though, there are some interesting new developments that we're learning American about that tell us a little bit more about uh, exactly the sophistication involved with the hijackers who took control of these airplanes. From sources today, we understand that in at least two of the cases, two of the four uh, airplanes, the transponders were apparently deliberately turned off. Now, transponders basically are uh, radio signals that send information to controllers about the plane's altitude, uh, the speed, generally the direction. It is the main radar signature. But we believe now that in the second jet that hit the World Trade Center and in the plane that came uh, into the Pentagon, that these transponders were turned off. Now somebody has to know a little bit about cockpits to know how to do that. The importance of that is that for a while, these planes, these flying bombs loaded with fuel, uh, were flying there where air traffic controllers didn't have a real good sense of exactly where they were, didn't know how high they were, didn't know exactly where they were going, didn't know their speed. That's important because if there was any level of warning after the first attack at the World Trade Center, the second one came in and at least for the last bit was flying blind. So the air traffic controllers could only watch in horror on the radar screens without knowing a whole lot about what that plane was doing, Dan. Bob Orr, live in our Washington bureau. Let me show you something now that we weren't able to show you before. This is a new bit of video, give you some perspective on what happened yesterday from the space station, high in space. This is what it looked like as the World Trade Center was hit. And the smoke from the fires. Our prayers and thoughts go out to all the people there and uh, everywhere else here. I'm looking up and down the East Coast to see if I can see anything else. And um, to the people in Washington. Now, the astronaut up there talking where you can see right in the lower right-hand part of your screen a, a huge white blob. Keep in mind the distance up. I don't know offhand, but something like 150 or 80 miles up to see that picture, if we could re-rack that tape for just a moment. And from that high up, you could you have this sweep of the east coast of New York Harbor, and then, you know, the fire and smoke. And it was one thing to show you a picture for some rooftop uh, here in Manhattan, another to show you the bellowing smoke just moving along the street like some monster, monster it was. It's another to see it from that high up in space. Perhaps we can get that picture up for you. 
as time goes along. If you were at home anywhere in the country and asking yourself, what can I do? I mean, is there anything I can do? You may want to consider uh, contacting the Red Cross or your local hospital to try to donate blood. Now, I want to make sure that there's an understanding here that some places uh, in New York, in New York City, particularly in Manhattan, oh, in the, over the last 24 hours, they said, look, we, we have enough blood for the next four or five days, but we don't know where we're going. Right now, we're told that there are urgent appeals for blood across the country. Now, blood supplies have been in, in short supply uh, for some little while. So if you're asking yourself, what can I do, consider contacting the Red Cross, your local hospital, and uh, give some blood. If it doesn't help directly in what's happening in New York and Washington today, it will wind up helping someone. Now, we reported earlier, we want to underscore that while the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, intended to lift its ban on flights, at very minimum airline flights, some of them around noon Eastern time today, they decided at the last minute not to do that. No airlines are, are flying today. None will be scheduled to fly today. And those of you who are traveling or intend to travel need to keep in mind that when the ban is lifted on flights, and let us hope it will be sometime over the next 24 hours. Even when it's lifted, it doesn't mean right away that the air service is going to be um, up to what it was before uh, these cataclysmic events that have happened over the last 24 hours because airplanes are out of place, crews are out of place. So you just want to keep that in mind. And also you have to be prepared, as Anthony Mason noted earlier, and I think Ed Bradley as well, uh, there are going to be a, a extensive security measures like you have never seen before at any airport. So the situation in the airports, it isn't a matter that, well, things are going to get pretty much back to normal sometime in the next 24, 48 hours. It simply isn't going to happen. Well, and, and also, we've had warnings about this, Dan. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. But the, the GAO and the Inspector General found problems with uh, both the, the people who uh, work at airports screening luggage and, and checking passengers as well as the equipment that they used. Uh, there was a report from the GAO in June of 2000 that airport screeners had missed as many as 20 percent of dangerous objects during tests. Uh, so it, it's not as if that this comes to us as a surprise. We've had warnings by official government agencies before. Well, let one say gently, nor should it have come as a surprise to us. Uh, that there was no, we didn't treasure, we didn't put high value on the people responsible for airport security. Low, low paid, and this is not to denigrate anybody involved in airport security, but it was, let's face it, it was pretty much a kiss off by the airlines and everybody else. Now, there have been various calls for federal uh, agencies to take over the security of U.S. airports. After all, these airports belong to the people of the United States, not to the airlines. Whether that will go anywhere, I don't know. We did have uh, sky marshals for, for a while in the late 70s on into the 1980s. They were done away with. I, my assumption is, Anthony Mason helped me, that one reason we did away with them uh, was a matter of budget, uh, of money. Well, it's, I, I don't recall the reason myself, Dan, but I mean, anybody who's been through an airport knows the security isn't as stringent as, as it could be. To some degree, I think we're to blame for that. We're used to, to moving fast, and we don't like to be inconvenienced. So, I mean, when you have, on the days when I've seen tough security at airports, you see an awful lot of passengers complaining. Well, that's true. And as Secretary Cohen uh, said uh, at some point in the hours preceding, uh, we need to have a national discussion of security versus civil liberties. Right. Uh, that's to say nothing of our desire to get moving and get through the airport very quickly. All of this will be in the process of uh, reassessment over the weeks and months to come. But I want to come back to in a few seconds we have remaining here before we go to our uh, break at 1 o'clock in the east, that we have a situation here where you know, we want the country to be steady. We, we, we want to get back to as close as normal as we can for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which to show those who made this attack on us uh, that, that, yes, they hit us a lick, they knocked us down, but we got up. But as the hours go by, and we're now into the second day, the enormity of actually doing that is beginning to sink in. It is not going to be easy. It is going to take time with all of these things we've talked about. Yeah. And there's also the concern that is there another shoe to drop yeah. that we have to get our system back up to normal? 
our flight system, our economic system, the Wall Street open again, and all things going as best they can uh, as they were before. But there has to be concern by the government, by security officials, is that is there a second page to these attacks? Mm -hmm. Was this just a, a, a one-day event uh, with no follow-up? Uh, or is there something else planned? Is it an effect of war? I mean... For example, they've closed the Potomac River uh, north of the Woodrow Wilson Excuse Bridge me, in Washington. Ed, you're watching continuing CBS News coverage of Attack on America. Sorry. Attack on America. Dan Rather, reporting from CBS News World Headquarters in New York with Ed Bradley and Anthony Mason here with me at the anchor desk. It's one in the afternoon in the east, and this is what lower Manhattan looks like. Smoke still bellowing high into the sky 28 hours after two crashing hijacked airliners toppled the twin World Trade Towers. New York City Mayor Giuliani says 259 uniformed city officers, that includes firemen and police, remain unaccounted for, and that scores of dump trucks swept the night hauling away rubble. Here's the latest. The FAA had hoped to lift its unprecedented ban on commercial flights at noon, but this has not yet happened. The FAA, in effect, has reversed its previous decision. We simply don't know what they're going to decide about resuming flights. President Bush calls the attacks, quote, acts of war. Here in New York, the confirmed death toll is 41 officially, with 1,700 injured. That toll will go dramatically up. Uh, there's a huge problem of clearing away the rubble and finding uh, the dead and, for that matter, people who may still be alive. The mayor says, quote, a few thousand are missing. Searchers do not expect to find more survivors from the Pentagon attack, with the death toll at the Defense Department ranging from a low of 100, well, upward from there. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld thinks it will not reach uh, what some people estimated as the 800 figure. The search for life under the Trade Center rubble is still the big story, the main story, and here tracking that effort is our 60 Minutes colleague, Ed Bradley. Ed? Dan, uh, th there are bits and pieces of information coming in. We've just been told that, uh, and some had heard earlier, that federal officials who spoke on the condition of anonymity said that they were investigating whether one group of hijackers crossed the Canadian border at a checkpoint there and then went to, uh, to Boston's airport where uh, the two airliners that brought down the World Trade Center uh, were hijacked. Uh, the Boston Herald, quoting a source that did not identify, reported that the authorities had seized a car at Logan Airport that contained Arabic language flight training manuals, uh, manuals, and the source said five Arab men had been identified as suspects, including one of them who was a trained pilot. So that there are leads out there, but uh, there, there aren't many, at least many that we know of. But the noose is tightening because they do have things that they're following, and it's just a massive investigative effort to track all of these leads down. And investigators are looking, as you say, to Florida, Canada, and beyond for answers to the single question, who could have done that? Who could have, who, who could have carried this off? And also, who financed it? Let's check in with Sandra Hughes at Los Angeles International Airport. Sandra? Well, Dan, you and Ed right. were speaking before about uh, the security issues, and, and there's been a lot of talk about beefing up security at airports across the country and how things are never going to be the same after yesterday. Well, CBS News has learned through our local affiliate here in Los Angeles that did an investigation back in 1999, an undercover investigation, that security personnel at the metal detectors have actually less training than the Starbucks coffee workers at the airport. If you can believe that, one and a half days of training is all that those security personnel uh, go through. And as Ed mentioned, even the General Accounting Office has, uh, has admitted, has found in a report that security personnel are poorly trained and that many don't even make as much money as fast food workers. Now, what uh, we are finding out is that some airports are already implementing some changes at Seattle Tacoma's airport. The airport has announced that in restaurants, metal silverware is out. They will only now be using plastic silverware, and no knives of any kind will be allowed through uh, a metal detector through any sort of security gate. Dan? Sandra Hughes at Los Angeles International Airport. Now back to Washington and our chief Washington correspondent, John Roberts. John. 
Well, Dan, the uh, bipartisan leadership from Capitol Hill just emerged from what was almost a 90-minute meeting with President Bush in the cabinet room where they were discussing the crisis and the appropriate American response to it. Uh, Speaker of the House uh, Dennis Hastert and Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle came out and said, Dan, and this is, is very important, a very important signal that they are trying to send this morning, both leaders saying uh, very firmly that Congress would stand shoulder to shoulder, Republican and Democrat, together with the president to support whatever measures the president decides. Speaker Hastert saying, anytime someone takes this country for granted, this Congress will stand united shoulder to shoulder. We will work together. We are in complete agreement that we will support the president. Senator Daschle saying that we literally and figuratively, figuratively stand shoulder to shoulder. We want to care for the families and punish those responsible. Uh, later on today, Congress will take up a very strongly worded resolution condemning this act and expressing uh, the united commitment of Congress to stand behind the president uh, to address this situation. Uh, Senator Dash are going on to say we stand not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans. Now, earlier today, Dan, following his meeting with his National Security Council, including Secretary of State Powell, the Vice President, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice's National Security Advisor, and others, the President issued some of his strongest language yet in response to the terrorist attacks yesterday, saying the deliberate and deadly attacks that were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. Now, the declaration that these were acts of war certainly does not trigger an official declaration of war by this country. There is some question as to whether uh, who you would uh, issue that declaration against, even if you were. But certainly, Dan, it ramps, ramps up the language, and in ramping up the language, it ramps up the commensurate response as well. We spoke yesterday to some degree uh, of how uh, justice did not necessarily mean bringing whoever was responsible to the United States to set them before the bar of justice, it would probably mean a decisive and punitive military attack, Dan. And, and, and this, this charged language this morning about these being acts of war certainly leads in that direction, Dan. Well, John, when you talk about um, decisive uh, military action, let's review what kind of, quote, decisive military action is possible even when and if they determine uh, somebody to attack. Well, Dan, you'll, you'll remember following the, uh, the embassy bombings in eastern Africa, there was some criticism of the Clinton administration that they, they fired a few cruise missiles at some sand hills in Afghanistan, and what damage did they really do? Uh, there, of course, was the, the damage to some facilities uh, in and around Khartoum in Sudan. But what, what did that really accomplish? Osama bin Laden, if they were trying to get him, certainly escaped from that. Let's not forget, though, uh, who was backing up the president's language about uh, decisive and, and, and punishing retaliation here. We're talking about Colin Powell, whose doctrine was overwhelming force during the Persian Gulf War. We're talking about Donald Rumsfeld, who is a seasoned veteran of the Pentagon. And we're talking about Dick Cheney, who as a Secretary of Defense under George Bush the Elder prosecuted the Persian Gulf War. These are people who have experience in using force, Dan, and the experience that they have in using force is to use as much as possible to get the job done. Now, not saying that in this case they will be able to do that, but at least that's the philosophy from once they come. John Roberts at the White House. Ed Bradley has uh, a developing story, uh, granted a side story for the moment, a developing story in Boston, Ed. Well, Dan, as you know, the two of the planes were hijacked in Boston. And we've just been told that uh, a SWAT team uh, composed of uh, FBI uh, officers as well as Boston police officers have stormed into the Westin Hotel in Boston's Back Bay. They're heavily armed. They went in uh, carrying shields. We don't know if this was uh, is related to uh, the hijacking in Boston, but uh, they're moving in and, and apparently searching through the hotel. Uh, there, as we said, dozens of police officers and FBI agents uh, who are now inside the hotel. Uh, what they're doing, we can't say for sure, but it certainly s would seem to uh, be related to the continuing search for uh, people who were involved in this hijacking. Well, uh, this photograph is from outside the Weston Copley Hotel. And that's where the FBI bomb squad uh, went in just a short while ago. Details of what that is about, uh, we could only speculate, and that we are not going to do. But this is the live picture in Boston of uh, where this FBI uh, SWAT team in uh, full gear, including bullet-resistant vests and uh, automatic weapons, has just gone into this hotel. 
as I say, no one knows what that's about, but it'll be interesting to see as time goes along. Well, there was uh, one graphic before that said they had 700 leads. So they have to follow up a lot of these leads. This may just be a case of them trying to follow it up. Very well could be, and we mentioned the FBI, but also, as you see, the Boston police uh, helping the FBI there, and it was, if anything, the police uh, who came in, in numbers. This is not unusual. The FBI says, listen, we want to go in here, and we don't know what kind of situation we're getting into, and they call for help from the local police force and get it. So we'll try to keep you posted as time goes along about what that was about uh, in Boston. We simply don't know at the moment, although, as Ed Bradley points out, the probability is that uh, among the 700 leads, the FBI prioritizes and, uh, for whatever reason, decided to go into that hotel in Boston and uh, follow up on a lead. Let's check in with uh, retired U.S. Army Colonel Mitch Mitchell. Uh, our old friend from the Persian Gulf War, who was near the Pentagon when the plane went down yesterday. Uh, Colonel, always good to see you. What was it like? Nice to see you, Dan. It was a tragic event, Dan. We saw the last seven seconds of Flight 77. We were driving south on Route 395, which butts up against the Pentagon. We were exactly adjacent to the Pentagon when I looked out in front of me and saw the American Airlines plane coming right across the, the highway directly in front of us at a distance of about 100 feet and an altitude of no higher than 20 feet. We thought it was going to hit us. All I had time to say was, it's going to hit the Pentagon. We turned and looked and watched it slam into the building. It was a terrible thing to see, Dan. I wish I'd never seen it. Well, Colonel, uh, one question has been asked me, and I don't have the answer, and perhaps you do. Uh, these hijacked aircraft were in the air for quite a while. Uh, they made... Uh, unusual turns to say the least. Word, why doesn't the Pentagon have the kind of protection that they could get fighter or interceptor aircraft up and if somebody's going to plow an aircraft into the Pentagon uh, that we have at least some some line of defense? This is one of the most difficult attacks to defend against Dan. Even if we scramble the fighters it takes time for them to get in the air and get to the location where the attack is going to occur. And they certainly didn't give us much time after they left Dulles Airport. The point is, though, that the air traffic controllers have to determine that there really is an emergency. And it takes some time for them to discern exactly what the situation is, especially when they're dealing with aircraft that are handled by apparently professional pilots who know how to turn off transponders. They're not sure what they have in the air exactly. And so until they can understand what the situation is, they're not going to scramble the military. Only then can the military be effective. And I might add that if they had been called in to shoot down this plane, they would have had to shoot it down at ground level and caused a number of civilian casualties on the way into the Pentagon. Probably the lesser of the two evils, but it was a lose-lose situation. Colonel, thank you very much. We'll be talking to you as the day and the evening goes along. Dateline Boston, heavily armed police and FBI agents swarmed into a downtown Boston hotel. And CBS News 48 Hours producer Josh Yeager is on the scene. Josh, tell us uh, what happened at the Boston Copeland. Dan, I'm standing in uh, front of the Boston Copley Hotel, one of the most uh, chic hotels in Boston. Security is heavy and tensions are high here. There are at least 30 uh, armed Boston police officers here, an EMS, emergency medical services truck. I saw several ATF agents entering the building. It's been reported here uh, that uh, police are interested in this building because there's uh, rumors of a suspect on the 16th floor. Uh, while I have not seen any FBI, personally, uh, it has been reported that FBI are inside the building. Police, within the last five minutes, have moved the crowd of roughly 2,000 citizens and press back from the front door of the hotel. Uh, and I say again, tensions are high. We are waiting to find out what's going to happen, and we are not alone. Dan? Josh Yeager uh, on the scene in Boston. By the way, law enforcement sources say no arrests were made. Ed Bradley? Yeah, no arrests were made. No arrests have been made the... so far, no. Uh, we, it, it does seem like something is about to happen, but nothing's happened by way of an arrest so far. Uh, uh, thanks, Josh. Ed? I, I think what they found was an empty room, that uh, they have evidence that indicates that that room might have been used by one of the hijackers, and they were going in to, A, see if there was anyone else there, and, B, search that room. Let's go back now to Washington and Colonel Mitch Mitchell. Colonel, what about uh, the options for retaliation? I, I, by the way, before you answer the question, let me point out to our viewers, we're, we, you know, we, we swing with the news here, 
and uh, what, what looked like a story developing in Boston turns out for at least the moment to be uh, a lot of picture and not much story. Now, Colonel, thanks for bearing with us. Let's talk about the retaliation options. There's a lot of tough talk coming out of Washington, but uh, as we know, talk is cheap. When you get down to the reality, what retaliation options are there? Dan, the smart thing to do is to get the proper intelligence about what actually happened and why it happened and who was responsible for it. Once you pinpoint the responsible party, and of course everyone is saying it's Osama bin Laden, and I believe that too, once you've determined that, then you go for the target. And you have to have a specific plan, just as if you were engaging in an invasion. It's a military operation. It has to be carefully planned out and very, very carefully executed. And it, all those things take time. You want to make sure that you don't cast your net out there and come up empty. You've got to catch the guy the first time you go after him. So I think we're going to do some detailed planning, make sure that we have the right target, and then we will send in overwhelming and powerful force to attack that target and hopefully rid ourselves of this person once and for all. Colonel Mitchell, it's a, a tough fact to face, but face it we must, that mm -hmm. Afghanistan is the graveyard for Western military operations, and for that matter, the Soviets mm -hmm. learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. Anybody who goes into Afghanistan meets uh, an unusually determined uh, opposition. It's just a way of saying, put this in context for us. Suddenly we're talking about, you know, overwhelming military force in Afghanistan, but is that really an option? It can happen, Dan, but we, what we don't want to do is go the route the Soviet Union went when they went in and stayed in there and got sucked in, as we did in Vietnam, and right. stay and stay and stay. What we need is a clear-cut plan that says exactly what we're going to execute and how we're going to get out of there. And I would expect something like this would be over very quickly. It wouldn't be a matter of months or years. It would be a matter of days before we executed what we had to execute. And by the way, President Bush was uh, very clear in his statement when he said that uh, he's going to be looking at those who harbor such people as Osama bin Laden. So I think we would have a big mission in a country like that. Colonel, uh, thank you again. We may want to come back to you right now. Ed Bradley has an update on this security situation in Boston. Ed? Well, uh, Dan, when Boston's Logan Airport does reopen, the aviation director there said that the FAA was going to require all U.S. airports to comply with some emergency safety measures. As Sondra Hughes mentioned, that would include banning the sale or the use of knives, knives, even plastic knives at, at the airport. They want to evacuate and sweep all of the terminals in this country with, with K-9 teams, and they want all U.S. airports to comply with some emergency uh, safety measures. Uh, they're going to do increased security personnel checks, they're going to increase ID checks, and they are definitely going to discontinue curbside check-in. Ed Bradley, if Colonel Mitchell is still with us in Washington, uh, Colonel, if, if, I hope that you're still there. We, what about the arguments, and we've heard some on the air the last few days, that, look, American intelligence and our whole decision-making apparatus in Washington is so focused on Osama bin Laden and they're not even seriously considering the possibility uh, that some state supported terrorist operation may be, if anything, working in conjunction with Osama bin Laden. And of course, the name Saddam Hussein comes to, uh, comes to the tip of the tongue pretty quickly. Yes, Dan. Uh, there has to be some state sponsorship in here. How would those pilots who flew those airplanes be trained? They certainly were, to get, were not going to get trained in Afghanistan. So there has to be some connection. And that's what makes the job for our intelligence people so difficult. Not only do we have to pinpoint the mastermind behind such an attack, but we have to see all his partners as well and make sure that we bring them to justice at the same time. State-sponsored terrorism is indeed a, a possibility here. And when we say we conduct a war on terrorism, that isn't saying anything at all. We have to be much more specific and say exactly who we're conducting this war against and who, and who that we are going to use to defeat them. Notice also we have allies now who are starting to come to our assistance and say, we will join you in this hunt. So the European Union is beginning to make noise about that, and I think that's a good thing, because the terrorists are going to start feeling the pinch of more than just the United States statement that they're going to retaliate. Let us hope. Thanks very much, Mitchell. Let's go to John Franklin in Lower Manhattan. John? 
Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Again, we are at North Moore and the West Side Highway. I'm guessing about five or six blocks north of where the World Trade Center's towers once stood. You can still make out the smoke. Uh, fires probably still burning. Very intense heat. And also the weather of today, which is hot out, is not helping things either. We know that uh, there have been lots of heavy construction vehicles that have made their way down to the site. There are many more that are still lined up here along West Side Highway. Big, heavy dump trucks that will uh, help take out much of the debris as they make their way through it piece by piece because obviously they're still looking for some survivors uh, in the uh, attack. Um, we know that we have seen pictures of some of these dump trucks and these bulldozers actually holding up some structures so that uh, the workers can get in there and remove some of this debris. And we have also seen a, a good number of EMT personnel make their way down. So as the clock continues to tick, fresh personnel making their way into the area, trying to get down, relieving those that have been working through the night and under these intense conditions. So it's both a, a an, an objective to remove the debris and to still try and find those who may have survived through the night and uh, are under some of that rubble. Dan? John Franco. Now overseas, CBS News correspondent Mark Phillips in our CBS News Bureau in London. Mark, uh, bring us up to date on what's happening with NATO. Another important meeting is either in progress or about to be. Uh, we expect to hear from NATO within the next hour that they are doing something they have never done before, which is to invoke Article 5 of the uh, North Atlantic uh, Charter. That's the uh, charter which declares that an attack on one uh, country in NATO is an attack on all and commits each member to take such action as is necessary. I'm quoting here uh, the use of armed forces, for example, to restore and maintain security in the North Atlantic area. While all of the options, uh, retaliation options, are being discussed, uh, the finding the culprits, of course, and then finding where they are and finding targets, What's happening here uh, in Europe is that the groundwork is being laid, if you will, the foundations of support for any American action and perhaps even international action uh, is being laid so that there isn't then an issue of discussing who will participate, what basis can be used, and that sort of thing. Uh, a NATO meeting is uh, scheduled to be happening within the next 10 minutes, and we expect to hear within the next 40 minutes or so that this charter, never before invoked, uh, has been uh, invoked. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here. Prime Minister Blair, of course, uh, has recalled Parliament, uh, which had been in recess, uh, saying this was an attack on the very notion of a democracy and that democratic voices uh, ought to be heard. Blair, as well, uh, along with uh, most other, many other world leaders, uh, spoke to President Bush uh, today uh, as the areas of discussion uh, included, uh, no doubt, uh, cooperation in any future action uh, that, might, uh, that might be taken. Uh, Blair was very specific in, in not commenting on what individual aspects uh, might be undertaken, which bases might be used and that kind of thing. Uh, he said these were just not appropriate areas of discussion. And one final area, uh, one final interesting point is that there was another statement today from uh, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Uh, basically saying that uh, any attack would only sow the seeds of further uh, anger and further uh, hatred in the region. Dan? Mark Phillips in London for developments, and there are some breaking at the moment. Jim Stewart in Washington. Jim. Dan, uh, federal authorities have conducted and completed a raid on a hotel in downtown Boston that they believe may apparently have been used by one of the hijackers, but they're not certain yet. They are inside a, uh, one of the rooms in the hotel conducting a search there. Uh, there have been reports uh, that people have been arrested in connection with this case. As a result of that raid, I would tell you that is not true. There have been no arrests made in connection with the terrorist attacks thus far. People have been taken into custody, we are told, but these are people who apparently had problems with the INS, the Immigration Naturalization Service, that were discovered as a process of these raids. I can also say that I believe this is a, a sequence of events that we're going to see unfold throughout the day in various parts of the country. Some of this comes as a result of intelligence tips and intelligence communications intercepts, and some of it is coming as a result of a study of the flight manifest, people who were on that flight that they think deserve uh, more attention, relatives of people on that flight who they think deserve more attention. Uh, I can also say that uh, 
that federal authorities believe now, having gone through all of the uh, telephone conversations that were going back and forth yesterday, and I have to tell you, Dan, it, it's an, it, it becomes more incredible to me by the hour, the number of phone calls that were made from these doomed aircraft uh, while they were in the sky, apparently some with the blessings and insistence even of the hijackers. This one, however, apparently did not have their blessing. A person phoned from Flight 93, this is the United Aircraft Recall, that left Newark and was en route to San Francisco and crashed in Pennsylvania. This uh, passenger called and said that a fight had broken out apparently between other passengers and the hijackers and that the passengers were attempting to control the aircraft. The conversation ended then. The presumption is that this fight led to a loss of control. The airplane was, we are told, was at approximately 500 feet uh, level flight when it uh, nosed into the ground. Uh, in other developments today, the FBI is also conducting search warrants, as we reported earlier, at two commercial flight schools in Florida. It is thought that these two schools were the sites where some of these hijackers learned their trade. Uh, these men are believed to have had a long-standing relationship to Ramzi Youssef, a name well known to terrorist experts. He was involved, as you might recall, in the first failed attempt to bomb the World Trade Center in 1993. That's all we have from here at the moment, Dan. Tim Stewart, we've had pieces of the story and now we get additional pieces on that United flight that left Newark and then wound up crashing in southwestern Pennsylvania. A, a, a hellacious scene um, ensued in that airline, and we, we now see that some of, the, some of the passengers, some of the men passengers, realized uh, that what was going on and made an attempt uh, to fight. Uh, this becomes clearer if we pick up additional uh, information from cell phone calls made from the aircraft. Uh, the, the picture painted is one of heroics, uh, the full extent of which we may never know. But the picture does begin to get filled out, that this aircraft was, had turned around, was being headed back toward Washington or in, in the area of Camp David, the presidential retreat. And when some of the Mayo passengers in the plane realized uh, some of what was happening, uh, they had attacked the hijackers and uh, the plane wound up crashing about 80 miles from Pittsburgh. Anthony Mason, let me check with, uh, if there's there are some developments on the financial page uh, in this last hour. Bring us up to date on that. We've got a joint statement, uh, Dan, from the finance ministers and the central bankers of the group of seven nations. These are the seven wealthiest nations. Uh, basically what they're saying, well, I'm going to quote them, we are committed to ensuring that this trage tragedy will not be compounded by disruption to the global economy. Basically, they're saying we're going to make sure that any bankers out there who need money can get it. Uh, we're going to make sure this economy stays up and running, that the global economy is not disrupted. This is a show of unification, a show of support, an attempt to prevent you know, damage to, to global confidence at this point. And what's happening on the foreign uh, markets? Uh, what's happening in, in Tokyo, Hong Kong, in, London? In, I don't have the latest numbers, but the encouraging news this morning from Europe was that, uh, that after initially going down, the FTSE in London, the DAX in Frankfurt, both actually turned around and went up for the, for the day. I'm not sure where they stand at the moment. But the initial damage was yesterday. Today, people seem to kind of pull back. Trading is light. Uh, really, the entire financial world now, I think, is just kind of standing back to, 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 to watch things settle. You have enormous disruption in New York, but in fact, the financial world is functioning. Uh, I talked to some bankers today who said the Fed stayed open very late last night, so all these banks could resolve all of their transactions, and in fact did. A banker told me, he said, we actually closed our books last night when you consider everything that happened. That's pretty amazing. Ed Bradley, change the subject very quickly, but you've been talking about intelligence, how to improve it, why it didn't uh, alert us to these tragic events. But one thing, American intelligence over the last 15 to 25 years has moved increasingly into high tech and away uh, from what we call on the ground human resources. I think that has been the big criticism from a lot of intelligence experts is that we are very reliant uh, on sophisticated listening gear. Uh, we've seen it all in the movies and some of it does exist where key words will uh, turn on a computer to record a conversation. Uh, yeah, for example, they, if you're talking to the phone, you mentioned Osama bin Laden, it gets kicked clicks out. Clicks in. And that these, these are picked up by satellites, 
that they can monitor any telephone call, uh, landline, uh, cell phones, uh, very sophisticated listening devices. But where the United States is weak is in the area of human intelligence. And it was, we've seen it repeatedly in Iraq, for example, in the inability to put someone on the ground in Iraq who can give you information from Saddam Hussein's inner circle. In, the, in Afghanistan, to put someone on the ground in the inner circle with Osama bin Laden to give you human intelligence, or even not just in the inner circle, but someone who can stand off a distance and say, this is where they are today. I mean, this is a man who supposedly moves three or four times a week. How do they keep track of him? And we are very good on these sophisticated intelligence listening devices and, and not as good when it comes to human intelligence and putting people on the ground to eyeball what is going on. And if you think it's tough to do that in Iraq, Afghanistan would be much, much more difficult. Our CBS News coverage of the attack on America will continue after a few seconds. We break away to give some of our stations an opportunity to go to local coverage if they choose to do so. But on many of these stations, we'll be right back after a break of only five to seven seconds with more of our CBS coverage of the attack on America. Hello again, Dan Rather.